Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adita Chaudhary. I'm from uh, the Science and Technology Studies Department at York University in Toronto, Canada. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about fire ecology and a bunch of other stuff that I'm interested in that intersects with uh, academic study of fire ecology, but also narrative and metaphor when it comes to fire. So I became interested in fire and by extension how fire is studied in the ecological context because I didn't want to be tied down to one place uh, in particular uh, and I did not want to be tied down to a specific field site. I wanted to be everywhere and nowhere at the same time knowing that fire uh, in its temporal and spatial scales was never too far away. So I am uh, compelled by two parallel but intersecting lines of inquiry. So the first is fire as a chemical reaction facilitated by biotic and abiotic elements, which is combustion. And uh, that is understood through empirical and positivist lenses and fire as a manifestation of a set of relationships within ecosystems and processes uh, and the embodiment of these interlocking entities as what Donna Haraway has called companion species, although not all fire is companionate. I'm interested in the tensions that are situated in the space between these two lines of inquiry and I'm inspired by the potential for narrative that fire provides us and what thinking of fire as a companion species can tell us about the geographies we traverse in the world today. So um, academic fire ecologists tend to see the coming together of the biotic and abiotic elements of fire as something that could be quantified and be made legible through positive mo modes of inquiry and be predicted through a series of calculations and qualifications rooted ultimately in what is known as the fire triangle. Factors such as fuel load in an ecosystem, meteorological influences can uh, indicate fire risk, uh, while flame height intensity, total area burned, normalized burn ratio, leaf energetics, wind dynamics, etc., can predict the intensity of the fire and its capacity for destruction. These factors are carefully quantified and are employed, employed in a number of empirical practices through which fire ecologists map their relationship to fiery or potentially fiery spaces. Um, fuel loads are estimated through a combination of empirical data gathered in the field and uh, with models uh, of how fire may ignite and spread through an ecosystem. Leaf geometries are considered um, through heat and mass transfer experiments to show how specific composition of different species uh, with their unique shapes and sizes um, along with other plant debris in combination with weather conditions and local botanies might create specific kind of forests and as a result, unique fire regimes. <coughs> Uh, there's also novel cartographic techniques that are used to predict fire behavior and uh, take the necessary precautions to manage um, uh, the role of fire in ecosystems. Um, so these modes of attention to discrete but ultimately intertwined aspects of an ecosystem reveal that fire ecologists um, often relate to fiery spaces through carefully quantified and curated uh, images, numbers, and shapes. These are the mediations that they use in, or in the absence of being close to the fire uh, in, in person. Their models provide various degrees of accuracy and precision uh, of fire behavior, and this focus has traditionally been oriented with quantifiable models. Also show fire ecologists delineate landscapes and ecosystems with certain features whose ideal models are plugged into the relevant equations while others are discarded or concealed. One must ask at this point, what is discarded and concealed from this idealized mathematical world? Or rather, what happens to these discarded and concealed variables materially in this world? Since academic fire ecology and its application within policy are what informs the overall standards of fire governance, it would be a mistake to see these modes of attention as divorced from the racialized histories of fires in the whole world, but in particular because my field site, uh, primary field site is there, the Americas. In my research, I've been looking at old newspaper reports of fires in California. There is a curious trend that appears repeatedly, especially in the 19th century. Uh, that is, the severity of the fire is detailed according to the dollar value of the property damage, while the blame is often put on indigenous people. So there is a specific law that existed in California's um, judicial system, which basically forbids the use of fire in ecosystems. Um, you can read that here. And 
it basically really targeted people that had been using fire in these ecosystems for hunting, for cultural practices, and just general ecosystem management, which was um, the indigenous people. And, um, you know, I spoke with a journalist from the Zolon tribe spe specializing in indigenous and environmental and science issues. And she basically talked about how this model of fire suppression that was codified into law uh, through this um, act of the government and protection uh, of Indians uh, in 1850, uh, was it was fire suppression that was used to subjugate uh, the indigenous Californians by removing them from their lands. Um, you know, so overgrown lands result in loss of food species um, and because the deer cannot move through thick forests and the birds leave, the beneficial plants get choked out, springs dry up. Uh, so they used to shoot Indians when they burned because of, you know, they were, they were criminalized for cultural burning practices. Um, and this is in the context that indigenous Californians have regarded fire as a gift from the creator and a friend. And this companion relationship that indigenous Californians had with fire was thus abused in order to subjugate and marginalize them through colonization. Uh, one of my main interlocutors, a fire ecologist in the US Forest Service has recounted that early foresters in the Americas trained in the German tradition of scientific forestry, wanted to make timber yields as reliable as possible every year and remove any barriers towards that end. The burning practices of California's indigenous people appeared to colonize their fire foresters as something that was counterproductive to these aims and um, that the indigenous people did not value the timber product and were thus incapable of governing themselves and the land. They had to be disappeared in order for the landscape to match the idealized equations for forest growth and timber production. And so they were. And accordingly, this human variable in fire ecology remained discarded and concealed in institutional fire ecology for long as well. One way to think about fire in the Americas is to think of it as a much policed companion species. Um, the fighting fires rhetoric has been employed in much of the discussions about fire in the Americas has also been embedded in a system of thought um, that is carceral and punitive to specific communities. As with the example given before, this particular line of thinking also inscribes within it racial hierarchies and histories um, and the marginalization of fire with the aim of the subjugation of black, indigenous, and people of color. The role that race plays in this is crucial, and the policing of fire and the short-sighted removal of it from ecosystems and the subsequent oppression of indigenous peoples parallels the workings of the carceral state and its functions in circumscribing who gets access to capital, resources, power, and ultimately freedom and sovereignty. So, consider the sati, the ancient Hindu custom of burning widows in the funeral pyres of their hu dead husbands. Um, that's the picture. Uh, on the on the uh, right there. Um, so this is a Savarna Hindu practice that is now defunct. This uh, practice uh, involves it, it re inscribing this purification process, which masks this act of violent misogyny. In a similar vein as the witch trials of Europe, a subcategory of the companion species of fire that is holy fire is inscribed with certain properties and training so as to act, uh, so as to mask the act of murder into an act of virtue. This fire is the pet of Savarna Hindu law and Christian laws that naturalize violence against women and re-territorialize the relationship with the companion species as something that does the bidding of patriarchy. Uh, these are like attack dogs meant to murder women, but while they're doing it, the spectacle is upheld as something that either restores virtues to a community by taking the life of a fallen or an evil woman or bringing glory to a community um, as a woman rendered burdensome is forcibly put on the funeral pyre for husband. Um, in this iteration, fire is the lapdog of patriarchy and it decimates the life of anyone who presents a threat to an orthodox patriarchal order of being. So, next slide. So this is a, a satellite image of the Paradise Fire in California from November 2018. Uh, you probably have heard of it. 
So I know from my interlocutors who work with satellite imagery to study fire that the causative agents of fires are indistinguishable in this kind of satellite imagery. So you can really see the fire very clear, clearly and where it's going, but you don't really know what causes it um, and uh, whether it's climate change that caused it or something else. So whether it's a building fire, a forest fire, it appears the same. However, their intensities and spread may differ. Satellite imagery thus flattens the fiery relationships on Earth. And I wonder then if it was possible to take satellite images of Europe and South Asia during the Middle Ages, how many Sethis and witch burnings will appear dot across the land masses? And like settler colonial racism and racialized capitalism in California, would patriarchy and misogyny also become concealed as a variable in the consideration of this fires uh, in the way that uh, the institutional fire uh, ecology has disappeared certain variables as well. So I think a lot of the prior discussion about fire in the sense of pyropolitics have left out the more than human relationality that comes uh, with it. And it has sort of seen fire as an agential but ultimately subservient tool in human politics. The companion species model of fire adds further complexity to it and shows us through either caring for or fighting fires how pyropolitics becomes racialized and gendered in unique ways. The companion species understanding of fire also helps get beyond the reductive quantification of academic fire ecology, where in order to replicate these idealized models, ecosystems are subjected to logics of settler colonialism and extractive capitalism. And um, fire as a companion, though, instead can act as a witness to the erasures that happen. They are, they are filled with archives and memories. Um, and the fires that, uh, the archives and memories that fires leave in their wake is a reminder of the, to the extent, inextinguishability of the socio-politically inconvenient at any given time. And so living with and instead of fighting fires and seeing fires as companion species then may help us illuminate our collective shadows by seeing them as agential beings which, with memory and witness. Thank you.